Giacomo Puccini is one of the most famous Italian composers and is considered the greatest exponent of operatic realism. He was inspired by impressionists like Igor Stravinsky and contemporary composers like Claude Debussy, Richard Strauss, and Arnold Schoenberg. Puccini's earlier works reflect the style of the traditional 19th century romantic Italian opera and develop into the realistic verissimo style he is most recognized for. Puccini gives the orchestra a more active role with contemporary developments while still keeping the traditional vocal style of Italian opera where the singers carry the burden of the music. Puccini composed a dozen operas including the more popular Manon Lescaux, La Bome, Tosca, Madame Butterfly, and of course Tarando. He claimed the basis of an opera is its subject and its treatment, and he took a more dramatic approach to the musical composition itself. Puccini wanted the action of his operas to be uncomplicated so that spectators who didn't understand the words could still comprehend what was happening on stage. His works reflect a common theme of he who has lived for love has died for love, which is evident through the fate of his heroines, who devote themselves to lovers, but are tormented by feelings of guilt and pain, which ultimately destroys them. Born in Lucca, Tuscany on December 22, 1858, Giacomo Puccini was the last descendant of a family who had been the musical directors in the Cathedral of San Martino for two centuries. Orphaned at five, the municipality of Lucca supported him with a small pension and kept the organist position open for him at the cathedral until he came of age. In 1876, Puccini saw a performance of Aria and was convinced his true vocation was opera. Four years later, he went on to study at the Milan Conservatory of Music under Antonio Benzini and Amalekar Pocelli. In 1884, Puccini produced his first one-act opera, La Ville, whose premiere at the Milan's Berme Theater was a huge success. Julio Riccardi, a music publisher, was so impressed with what he saw, he immediately purchased the copyright and commissioned Puccini to write a new opera. After the death of his mother, Puccini fled Luca with a married woman, Elvira Jimmy Yanni, which was quite the scandal at the time. In 1900, they moved to Torre del Lago, a small fishing village in Tuscany, where they built a small villa and were finally able to marry in 1904 upon the death of Elvira's husband. Elvira was the jealous type and began to suspect her husband was having an affair with one of their house servants, Doria Manfredi. Elvira threatened to kill Doria, causing the young maid to flee and ultimately commit suicide by poison. The Manfredi family had a doctor perform an autopsy, where it was discovered Doria was indeed a virgin when she died at 23. Elvira was found guilty of persecution in Colmene, but struck a deal to only pay damages to the family. After this, Puccini decided he could no longer be with Elvira, but agreed to coexist and demanded absolute freedom. In 1910, La Fensula del West premiered in New York City, where it was revealed to be inspired by Doria's sister Julia, who he had actually been having an affair with. Despite all the scandal, Puccini continued to rise in popularity. He wrote a set of three one-act operas as a part of El Chitico, which also premiered in New York City in 1918. The three operas were very stylistically different, beginning with the melodramatic El Tabaro, moving into the sentimental Sour Angelica, and ending with the comedic Gini Schicchi. Puccini lived out his final years in Viareggio, battling with throat cancer. He was ordered to Brussels for surgery in November 1924 and sadly passed away only three days later with the incomplete score of Turandot in his hands. Although he passed away before he was able to finish Turandot in its entirety, it remains one of Puccini's greatest works and a significant part of the history of opera as a medium of performance. Turandot was eventually finished by Franco Alfano, despite Puccini wanting Riccardo Zandonai to be the one to complete it. <laughs> On April 25th, 1926, approximately one year and five months after Puccini's death, Turandot was premiered at La Scala Milan. The audience would experience a story of princes and princesses, serfs and servants, death and deposition. The story is centered around the title character, Turando, a Chinese princess, and her rule was basically that any man who wishes to be her suitor must answer three of her riddles correctly or else they die. Act 1 starts with one of these unfortunate suitors, the Prince of Persia, who is set to be beheaded by the next moon rising for failing the riddles. The news is announced by a Mandarin, basically a messenger, in the opening Popolo de Pechino, and the crowd surges in a frenzy to the gates of the palace to be stopped and brutally rejected by the Imperial Guard. An old blind man is pushed to the ground and is quickly helped by his sleigh girl, Liu. As the girl cries, a young prince from Tartary is like, 
hey, what's going on? And he comes to the realization that the old man is Timur, his father, and the deposed king of Tartary. Running to his father's side, he urgently tells his father to keep their names a secret. This is foreshadowing, as the Chinese had conquered Tartary and would most definitely put them to death if they were to be discovered. The prince then inquires as to why Liu is still loyal to Timur, in which he replies that once the prince smiled at her. These rather insignificant and almost shallow reasons to love seem to be a recurring theme in Turandot, although it is typically understood that Liu's love for the prince is the most pure. The execution of the Prince of Persia goes underway, and the crowd pleads Turandot to spare the handsome and kind prince's life. Coldly, however, Turandot swiftly orders the execution, much to the dismay of the crowd. Despite her quirky, murderous tendencies, the prince falls in love with Turandot based on her beauty, see what I mean by shallow reasons to love, and calls out her name three times, and then rushes to the ceremonial gong to hit it three times to officially begin the trial for Tarando's courtship. Before he can, however, he is stopped by the creatively and uniquely named three ministers, Ping, Pang, and Pong. They basically say, hey dude, you really shouldn't do that. Tons of guys thought they could do that before, and now they're dead. The prince says, nah. And then Timur and Liu say, hey, maybe those guys have a point. You really shouldn't do this. Liu is also madly in love with the prince, so she really doesn't want him to do it. Again, the prince says, Nah, and then says Terendo's name three times and strikes the gong three times. The crowd yells out death, Terendo accepts the trial, and the ministers laugh at the prince's foolishness. Act 2 opens with the three ministers lamenting their jobs and being stuck at the palace, and how they dream of their lives outside of the palace. Ping longs for the country houses in Honan, Pong remembers the groves near Tsang, and Pang recalls his gardens near Kyu. Their thoughts then go back to how many princes they've had to kill under Turandot's decree, and how they aren't sure whether to plan a wedding or a funeral. They then await the arrival of the Emperor. The next scene opens with the Emperor, Altum, and how even he is kind of weirded out by Turandot's hobby of murdering princes. He, like the others, urges the prince not to go through with trying to court Turando, but Still, the prince says, nah, bro. Turando then enters and explains why she does what she does. She tells about her ancestress, Lo Ling, and how she was a strong ruler over her kingdom against power-hungry and dominating men, until she was eventually raped and murdered by an invading prince. Turando says Lo Ling lives through her, and out of revenge, she will never let any man wed her. Even she tells the prince to pull out of the trial, and again, you can guess what his response was. Turando gives the first riddle. What is born each night, but dies each dawn? The prince answers easily, Speranza, hope. Turando doesn't even break a sweat. Turando then asks the second riddle. What flickers red and warm like a flame, but is not fire? The prince thinks for a second, but then says, Sangue, blood. At this point, Turando is starting to sweat. Starting to get mad, she asks the third riddle. What is ice which gives you fire, and which fire still freezes more? The prince proclaims confidently, Turando! It is Turando! The crowd cheers, and everyone is happy that the prince succeeded unscathed. Turando, however, is not, and she pleads at her father's feet for her not to marry the prince. The emperor insists that an oath is an oath, and that she must marry the prince. Turando then pleads to the prince, asking, Me porterai con la forza? Will you take me by force? This is where the prince gets cheeky and makes her proposal to Turando. He tells her that if she can guess what his name is before sunrise, then she can have him killed. If not, then she has to go through with marrying him. The third and final act has Turando undertaking any means necessary to find out what the prince's true name is. She commands that no one in the kingdom shall sleep until they find out the prince's name. The prince waits until then, anticipating his victory by singing arguably one of the most famous tenor arias of all time, Nessun Dorma, a triumphant piece of music that I have tried and failed to sing. Pinjaro! <laughs> Ping Pang and Pong all offer the prince the finest women and richest galore if he gives up Turando, but he refuses their offer. Grab your popcorn and rev up those fryers because this is when the story gets 
spicy. The Imperial Guards drag into Moor and Lu to have them confess, as they were seen with the Prince earlier. The Prince bluffs and says they know nothing. The Guards then begin to torture Timur, and Liu pleads them to stop, saying that she only knows the Prince's real name, but she will not speak it. Liu then is tortured heavily, but she has a strong resolve and will not speak. Turandot is impressed with Liu's resilience and asks how she was able to develop it. Liu answers with love princess before being tortured more. She tells Terando that even though she is begirdled by a heart of ice, she too will eventually learn what it means to be guided by a caring and compassionate love. And with that, she takes a dagger from a nearby soldier's belt and does the good old heart stab. Staggers to the prince, then falls dead. The crowd goes crazy, asking for Liu to say the name in her dying breath, but she doesn't. Since Timur can't see, he is told Liu is dead, and he cries in anguish and damns the crowd, saying that the gods are offended by Liu's death. The crowd then becomes subdued and ashamed. Liu's body is carried off, and everyone leaves, leaving Turindo and the prince alone. The prince criticizes Turindo for her brutality, but ends up embracing her in a kiss. The prince begs Turando for her to love him, and she is disgusted. However, after being kissed again, she begins to let her guard down, and admits that ever since she first met the prince, she both hated and loved him at the same time, similar to how I feel about LaCroix. Turando asks the prince to just leave, but then the prince announces his name, Calaf. Filio de Timur, son of Timur, effectively placing his life in Turando's hands. Thinking on what to do, Turando eventually decides that she loves the prince, and they join hands. She declares to the crowd that the prince's name is Love, and then the crowd cheers, and all is well in the kingdom of Peking, and the story concludes. <laughs> As stated in the beginning of the video, Puccini's style of opera was heavily dramatic and grand in scale, which perfectly encapsulates what Turandot is. Having been heavily inspired by Verdi's Aida, Puccini displays the innocent victim archetype which he loves to put in all his operas, like Mimi in La Bohème, Gloria Tosca in Tosca, and Cho Cho San in Madame Butterfly. In Turandot, it is found within the character of Liu, whose only crime was to love a man who never loved loved her back, and she ends up dying by suicide for that very principle. This is a story that would fall under the aforementioned verismo genre of opera, but only partially since the story is centered around a prince trying to win the courtship of a princess. It is possible for us to be seen as a verismo in that the tragedy of the opera is really only centered around non-noble Liu, as well as in some other parts with Ping, Pang, and Pong. One interpretation of the opera could be that the actual main character is Liu, and her conflict with having to long for the blissfully ignorant, optimistic, and borderline arrogant prince and having to die to protect him at the hands of the tyrannical queen, which could be seen as symbolism for how many ordinary and principal people can die just based on the actions of just two powerful members of nobility. Turandot's music resembles the drama of its plot being quite grand in both size and in composition. There is a large variety of instrumentation for the opera, which includes, and get ready for this, three flutes, two oboes, one English horn, two clarinets in B-flat, one bass clarinet in B-flat, two bassoons, one contra bassoon, two onstage alto saxophones in E-flat, four French horns in F, three trumpets in F, three tenor trombones, one contrabass trombone, six onstage flutes, six onstage trumpets in B-flat, three onstage trombones, Trombones, one on stage trombone, a percussion section including timpani, cymbal, gong, a twin triangle, a snare drum, bass drum, a tam tam, a glockenspiel, a xylophone, a bass xylophone, some tubular bells, two Chinese gongs, one on stage wood block, one on stage large gong, one celeste, one pipe organ, and two harps and strings. <sighs> So basically, it's a show that your middle school band may not be able to do. With this big an orchestra, there's not only a big sound that accompanies the singers throughout the opera, but a grand chorus as well. Both of these can be observed instantly in the opening piece, Popolo di Pechino. It opens with a loud, ominous, and nefarious tone that is dominated by unrelenting horns and strings before decrescendoing to allow the Mandarin to break the news about the Prince of Persia to the people of Peking. The piece picks up again with a hysterical 
musical crowd, the chorus in this case, which is underscored by the aforementioned dramatic horn and string combination that instantly sets a dramatic story with high stakes, making the audience interested and cognizant of what the story will be like and that the stakes are definitely very high. The piece also introduces the characters of Liu, the prince, and Timur in their contrasting vocal fox, that being soprano, tenor, and bass respectively. Coupled with the now more quiet yet still dramatic horn and string combo further, that greater raises the stakes. The song continues to weave these more quiet expositional parts with large and grand instrumentation and powerful choruses almost effortlessly, which was expertly crafted and intended for by Buccini. Another song that is worth analyzing and one that I have been itching to analyze is the famous aria Nessun Dorma, which also serves as a perfect example for Buccini's affection for epic and grand pieces throughout his operas. At this point, after solving the riddles, the prince knows that Turandot was basically his, despite even her best efforts to try to find out what his name is. The aria starts with him singing Nessun Dorma, Nessun Dorma, or None Shall Sleep Tonight, mocking the princess's decree. The song starts off quiet and soft, the beginning notes starting at a D4 before jumping down an octave to D3, and I see this as the prince poking fun at the idea that the people of Peking would be sleeping right about then, and the notes he sings were almost like how lullabies are in structure and how they go up and down. Accompanied by strings, the aria continues for a bit to poke fun at Turandot through soft and gracious melody before picking up at measure 10 with the line Ma el mistero e en me, or within my breast my secret lies. It continues to escalate until measure 13 where the vocal line crescendos into a forte high A in the line Sulla tua boca, in which we can also observe the instrumental section echoing measure 10, which seems to be a recurring motif throughout the piece. The next verse is similar to the previous one with slight variation in rhythm, emphasizing a more divided meter and having more more 8th and 16th notes instead of the more dramatic octave jump found in the first two measures. Measure 22 is also quite similar to measure 10 in progression and melodic structure, except this time it is sung by the chorus instead of the soloist. The soloist sings again in measure 25, mirroring measure 13 in the progression of notes up to the high A. At measure 29, the piece approaches its climactic high B, one of the most famous high notes in op operatic history, before resolving and letting the chorus take over the echo of the same melody and rhythm found in measures 10 and 22. To conclude, if you've not personally seen Turandot, I'd highly recommend to see it live, or on YouTube if you cannot. It's only around two hours in length, has lots of memorable arias, and is a dramatic and pretty engaging story to follow. One of the greatest mysteries in opera history is whether or not Puccini would have actually wanted the story to have a happy ending as it is in the finished version of Turandot, as he died before finishing it in his total and absolute vision. Overall, however, Turandot, when looked at upon from a historical and operatic perspective, is one of the most significant pieces of realistic and verismo opera in the medium, and serves as the final masterpiece to the trailblazing operatic maestro Giacomo Puccini.